All right, I think we can start this uh, first session, Law and Punishment in the Classical Antiquity. We have um, five, uh, five uh, um, participants. And uh, first, uh, I uh, invite uh, a colleague, Ivan Arambasic, uh, uh, our law student, uh, student uh, of the uh, University of Belgrade Faculty of Law, um, to uh, present his paper on the form of punishment in Roman law during the Empire. We had a nice introduction by Professor Tommaso Peggio, and so please. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this beautiful introduction of yours. Uh, I would like to say hello to all the participants and to all the dear colleagues of ours. Uh, my topic, uh, as the professor had already said, was is the forms of uh, the punishment in the period of the Roman Empire. Uh, professor Tommaso Beggio had already gave us uh, an introduction into this topic, uh, which is uh, the most beautiful introduction I have heard. Um, and uh, I would like to start uh, like why I've chosen this topic, uh, because it uh, might be uh, the most colorful uh, topic when we do talk about the Roman Empire uh, and the Roman law indeed. Uh, why? Uh, because the uh, penalties that had uh, been in the Roman law uh, in the period of the Roman Empire uh, uh, lived to see uh, the highest evolution in, right in that period. Um, the, our professor uh, Jacob Lyuklich um, told in his uh, book uh, that uh, the Principate uh, or the Empire in its own beginnings uh, was um, a monarchy behind, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, hidden behind the veils uh, of the uh, Republic. Uh, so the first one who uh, may have had some influences on uh, this topic was uh, Emperor Octavian Augustus. Uh, who uh, tried to uh, some kind, in some kind rebuild the Roman law. Uh, but um, in the later periods, especially when that monarchy that had been uh, behind the veil starts appealing to all of us, um, the uh, penalties uh, would uh, become uh, much, uh, as I would say, violate uh, and uh, much uh, let's say, uh, diversible between itself. Um, I would like to uh, put a note that um, in the beginning of uh, Principate, the Roman law was as it has been in the Republic, maybe slightly changed, but as the, empire, and, uh, but as the emperors uh, grew their power, uh, the uh, law was in their own hands. Uh, so, uh, we can uh, conclude that the very penalties that they could use um, would be of their own mind. Um, I would like uh, to give uh, an example of a um, uh, time of the Emperor Tiberius. Uh, we uh, can see that um, in, the, in that period, uh, the Christianity had already uh, started uh, its evolution, uh, and the Emperor Tiberius uh, was uh, known for punishing the Christians. Uh, the, Christ the Christianity is the main topic when we do talk about penalties in the um, ancient Roman Empire. Um, why? Uh, we can see uh, that uh, when the uh, Roman judges would uh, have a trial against the Christians, uh, they wouldn't uh, much uh, in the later periods. Uh, they wouldn't uh, think of the Christians uh, as uh, the Roman uh, citizens. Uh, they would be punished uh, severely because they, uh, they don't believe in what the Romans believe. Um, and uh, the, maybe the main example is the trial of Jesus Christ, as we can see. Um, we, uh, I think that we all know how the uh, Roman trials were held. Uh, and when we, uh, when, we, when we see the Jesus Christ uh, in that trial, uh, he is just being asked, uh, will you uh, leave Christianity and go back to the real uh, deity, so, or you'll keep it to yourself? Um, uh, he uh, stays in, the Christian, in, in his own uh, 
teaching uh, and is being sentenced to that. Uh, and when we uh, uh, compare it to the uh, Roman trials, that is pretty unfair, uh, injustice. Um, and uh, pretty this topic uh, is uh, the main one when we talk about the penalties. Um, because uh, when uh, such uh, diversities are made, we can uh, only conclude what will happen uh, to one person that lives in a province or uh, under the uh, rule of an uh, uh, um, uh, under the rule of the uh, commissioner who has the law in, in his own hands. Um, maybe the uh, most uh, famous uh, penalty in the Roman Empire, uh, when we talk about the history, uh, was um, the uh, killing uh, of the family members, uh, which was uh, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty legally uh, confirmed. Um, uh, for the example, uh, it was the Empress uh, Messalina Valeria, the wife of the Emperor Tiberius, uh, who uh, was killed. Uh, by, as Emperor Tiberius, uh, somebody writes that he said that, uh, that she uh, uh, crossed the law. She didn't, uh, she broke the law. Uh, so, um, I would like to conclude that uh, when we do talk uh, about the penalties in the ancient Roman Empire, uh, there are uh, many variations, and even if we um, do a uh, write the millions of scientific papers, we still won't be able to uh, put it all on the paper as we have uh, much to discover later. Thank you. Uh, we are leaving uh, the discussion uh, for the end uh, after all participants gave their papers. Uh, uh, I think uh, um, it is a, a limitation of for uh, 15, Nina, 15 minutes or 20. Let's, uh, but uh, Ivan was uh, quite uh, concise. Uh, and now um, I would like to introduce another um, participant, uh, Kasper Zohovsky, uh, from uh, University of Warsaw, Faculty of Law and Administration, and he will uh, speak about crime reports of uh, Epistates Philakiton. Um, well, I know something Greek. <laughs> um, and um, um, he, uh, in Papiri uh, of the first century. So uh, please go ahead. Uh, you need some. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. And I'm very glad uh, to uh, be able to come to Belgrade. And uh, I would like to ask is if everyone in the room uh, the handouts, uh, so I can maybe. Somebody will help yeah. to And after this short interruption, I will show the presentation, but great. And can I? Okay. Uh, can you see online the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So I will start. Uh, my name is Kasper Rochowski, as I have been introduced. And I would like to say a few words uh, about crime reports to Epistates Philakiton in papyri from first century Roman Egypt. So, uh, where 
is everything going on? We have new province, Egypt, Egyptus, and it was created in the year 30 BC uh, when the Rome annexed Egypt and created a new province, a new political being. And this meant a lot of changes, but one, uh, one of the most important is that the authority came from Rome, from outside uh, of Egypt for the first time in history, and the jurisdiction also came, juridical power came from outside, and Ptolemaic courts were no longer there. And uh, the, here we can see, sorry, here we can see uh, the map of the province a little bit later, and in this big rectangle is the uh, Arsinoites Nomos or modern Fayum, so the place where all the papyri I will talk about come from. And we have 32 petitions from a uh, Roman period, and they call from, uh, all come from Arsinoites. Earliest come from, comes from year 4 BC, latest uh, from year 42 AD. And here you can see an example of uh, one of such petitions and in their modern state of preservation. So reading those petitions, we can recreate the typology of wrongs. Here I will simply call them wrongs not differentiating if there was civil or criminal, as it has been said earlier, for this time it is not important, I would say, at all. And we can see the most common cry wrong is theft. Uh, this is present mentioned 18 times. It includes theft of a pig three times, and even one very interesting case of Urtum Reisuai, uh, namely the theft of a thing given uh, earlier as a security. We can see assault eight times, physical assault, or what we could call in Roman law terms, inuria, and uh, also six times grazing made by animals, or animals and shepherds. Uh, and in three cases, uh, the papyri are so poorly preserved that we can determine what uh, are the subject, what is the subject of these petitions. So, uh, as for Roman Egypt, uh, in a very, very important book, uh, Benjamin Kelly stated that there are many cases in which officials who technically did not have rights to exercise jurisdiction, and uh, for the need of this paper, it is also includes Epistates Philakiton, uh, which means the chief of guards, sometimes called chief of police, and that these officials were apparently approached directly by wronged parties with what appear to be requests for adjudication. And how is it so? So someone can't, uh, some official can't be a judge, but people seem to ask him for adjudication. And why is it so? So here are three main ideas, uh, uh, and I cite them after Kelly. And what first is that the prefect, so the governor of Egypt, uh, gave blanket delegations to subordinate officers in some categories of cases. Second is that this a form of rough police justice, uh, namely that it is this factual power of guards, of police, that they coerce people to right wrongs without, with no trial, and simply their authority, their factual power, can uh, mean they can serve as informal mediators. And the last idea is that these proceedings uh, that are started with petitions I'm dealing with were purely preliminary to a formal trial before a higher official or other official with actual jurisdiction. And as for uh, our uh, chief of guards, I think the first uh, explanation is not valid as we have no evidence of such delegation for this office and also we don't see uh, other arguments I will talk. Uh, about later. Second idea is not to be excluded that uh, a form of rough police justice uh, could cause these people to admit their crimes in this, I would say some, uh, as they were afraid of punishment. 
but still we don't see it very clear, clear clearly. And the last uh, idea, I think uh, the most proper one, is that these proceedings were preliminary to a proper trial with someone who has jurisdiction. So uh, how these petitions look like? When the perpetrator is unknown, we uh, have um, such formulation. We have also, of course, an uh, addressee, we have uh, the petitioner, we have date, and then the object of petition. So the peak worth 16 drachma was stolen from me. Wherefore, I beg you, let me start this philakiton, to write to the Arhefodos of the village, so this some lower official, that he make an inquire into the matter. And second example, very similar, and uh, is go as follows. A brute saw about two liter tawny colored worth 12 drachma was feverishly stolen from me in the village by certain individuals, no one's name named. Wherefore, I beg you to write that inquiry might be made into the matter. So uh, other petitions look very, very similar to this example. These are examples of it. And when there is a culprit, you can see on your handouts text number one and two uh, that uh, the, petit the petita of these uh, petitions uh, goes as follows. Wherefore, I ask you, if it seems good to you, that the accused be brought before you for the uh, consequent punishment. Or in Picos 14, wherefore, I ask you in order that it is written, so some orders, to a leader of grave diggers that he shall send them to you for the due punishment. And uh, these are exactly these uh, approaches that can suggest that he, have, he has some kind of jurisdiction or adjudication power. But I don't think it is the case. Because we have a very interesting case of papyrus, it's text number four. It's uh, papyrus from New York University uh, 2.3. Uh, and, uh, uh, oh, sorry for uh, mis, uh, misdating, it's 4 AD, not 5 AD as a uh, handout. And it is about, it is about a donkey driver and the superintendent of the donkeys. Uh, these cases are interesting on their own. I won't go very deep into this as the time is limited, but we can see here that superintendent of the donkeys uh, petitioned for the punishment, let's say, uh, for the donkey driver who wasn't fulfilling his duties. Very well, he even beat his uh, donkey, no, not his donkey, the donkey he was working with, and uh, the donkey died, and also he was sent away from his position and he took with him all the stuff needed for the donkey driving business. And how one document can shed light on others. Here we can see this papyrus in this modern state of preservation. It's uh, kind of destroyed, but still we can uh, read a lot. The petition goes as follows. Therefore, I submit this document to you, Epistatus Philakiton in order that after arresting him, you send the culprit up to those persons where it is fitting to send them up to. So here we can see very uh, uh, literally uh, evidence uh, that he had, the episode Philakiton has no jurisdiction on its own. And even uh, some petitioner who is not Roman citizen that we know from the name, uh, he knows that uh, the adjudication uh, will be uh, done by someone, uh, some, some offices, uh, with actual um, jurisdiction. And simply he formulated, we don't know if, we, if he does not know who is it, or he simply doesn't want to make a mistake. So he was this very general thought. Uh, what is also interesting that he here, fortunately, we have a uh, whole part of this petition because he used some preliminary uh, motions, let's say. He asks that he pays the price of the donkey, he pays for the idle days of the donkeys, and he also asks to give back the sacks and the axles and the tools. 
So uh, if we only had the second part of papyrus, uh, we can uh, conclude some uh, other things, some contrary wise, that it is epistates to adjudicate. But fortunately, we see that is not the case. And as for uh, Roman law concepts, we can see that here maybe we can we can see a more nowadays that we have the Danum emergens, lucrum uh, tessans, and maybe reivindicate. I don't think that the petitioner that the petitioner thought that way, but still we can maybe see here how universal was this concept of uh, Roman jurists or how they invented a wheel, very sophisticated wheel of um, this uh, uh, of this responsibility. Uh, and maybe this court that could be Roman conventus uh, set up uh, after annexation of the province, they could maybe, but we don't know that, of course they could uh, use some Roman legal institutions. And I think I need to finish or, okay. It was so interesting uh, because of this animal. Okay, so I, so I will conclude one minute, okay. Uh, so I hope it showed somehow that this petition, which was not included in previous research because all these uh, corpora of um, of uh, text of petition that Satis Pilagiton uh, didn't count this P, uh, didn't count in this P NYU to free, it can show that uh, the expla explanation is as follows, that most convincing is the third one. And thank you so much for your attention. Uh, here you can find selected bibliography, my email and image sources. Thank you very much, uh, colleague Casper. I was um, <laughs> so much deeply into your um, <laughs> paper that I forgot to warn you about time because there is a lot about animals. So I think I can, will have some questions later on. Uh, and now I will. Uh, uh, I would like to announce uh, another participant. I think uh, this time online. Uh, and this is um, Matteo Cristinelli uh, from uh, University of Trento, Faculty of Law. He will speak about um, delatores and accusatores uh, uh, during uh, the early principate. Um, and uh, my yes. colleague is here. I would yes. like Can you to hear me? ask him to. Uh, Go ahead and. Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Okay, I will share my handout then. Okay, I cannot share my handout. Okay, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a problem. Um, no problem, we'll just make you a present. Okay, okay. Please. So you should be able to now. Okay. Um, yes, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Poloic. I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for letting me speak today. I would also like to apologize to all of you for not being able to be there in person, and uh, but I hope in the future to be able to attend in person. And um, I would also like to apologize in advance because I think my my speech will be a little bit longer than <laughs> maybe expected. Uh, during my speech, I will talk about the ambivalent approach of the emperors during the early principate towards uh, the activities of delatores uh, and accusatores, and uh, uh, which usually translated on uh, the perspective of um, concerning punishment and uh, rewards given to this subject. Uh, to start, I would like to briefly recall one of the main features of the Roman system of administration of criminal justice between uh, uh, late Republic and Principate. Uh, since in front of the standing jury courts, we know the questions perpetue, 
there was no more. But I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you just zoom in your paper a little bit because we're in a big hall here and people sitting further okay. away can't read anything. Can you better now? Better if you could do it a little bit more. That would be great, like fit white or something. This way. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it was up to the, there was no modern public prosecution system. So it was up to the private citizen uh, acting as representatives of the community uh, to present an accusation against the alleged culprit uh, and to present the case. Uh, but to encourage this reporting activity, uh, the Legis Judiciorum Publicorum uh, provided for some form of awards to the accusers who su successfully managed to convict the indicted person. Um, since their activity uh, was essential to the proper functioning of the administration of justice, uh, during the Republic there was a general positive perception uh, of the accusers' activity, as we can uh, see in the text number one um, by Cicero. Uh, having a lot of accusers is good for the state, on one hand, they have a deterrent effect, so um, the fear of being accused uh, keeps the, pre the potential criminals from committing crimes. And on the other hand, uh, their activity is also es essential to uh, convict uh, those who broke the law. Um, already in the, early rep in the late Republic, we see, however, that uh, it starts uh, there is a, a widespread misuse of uh, accusatio uh, since criminal proceedings were uh, started not only to prosecute a criminal offense, uh, but also to hamper political, political and personal uh, enemies, to promote one's political career by accusing someone famous or simply tempted by the prizes uh, set by the criminal statutes. Um, so this generally positive opinion about prosecutors changed drastically during the Principate, already under Tiberius, as uh, stated in uh, the text number two, this part. You can see, see, maybe in English it's better. That's the informus of being invented. Okay. Um, Tacit Tacitus uh, complains uh, not only about the ineffectiveness of penalties uh, to limit the delatorious activities, uh, but, uh, but also that the outlook of prizes encouraged them, uh, knowing that they were backed by the emperors, as we, we uh, see later. Um, a side note, de la Torres was a term that could be used to indicate both um, criminal and uh, uh, fiscal prosecutors in the literal sources, and sometimes in the legal ones too. Um, the misuse of accusation uh, was a common practice, during the early Principate. This was due mainly to changes in the legal practice of the courts, the reshaping of the crimen majestatis, uh, the appearance of people uh, accusing on behalf of the various emperors in exchange for political uh, and economic advantages. Um, Augustus' successors uh, found themselves uh, in a rough position. On one hand, they could not do without the activity carried out uh, uh, by the criminal and fiscal delatores, uh, since the revenue granted to the Roman state by both those individuals was essential to the treasury. And also the accusatores were the main weapon uh, to keep in check and uh, when needed to strike the opposition to the new imperial rule. On the other, uh, the growing public hate towards the delatores uh, meant that the emperor could not openly endorse uh, their activities uh, as uh, uh, represented by the aphorism attributed, attributed uh, to Domitian by Svetonius uh, in the text number three. Uh, the literary sources are full of accounts of misuses of uh, criminal proceeding during the early Principate. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, significant cases uh, was that of uh, Vibius Serenus, uh, father and son, uh, which happened during the reign of uh, Tiberius. It's this one, I hope to, uh, I cannot, okay. Um, the, son, the son accused the father of treason against the emperor in front of the Senate, 
In Tacitus' uh, words, it seems that the, char the charges were at least inconsistent, uh, if not completely slanderous. Um, since the evidence uh, um, of the alleged crime was lacking and afraid of the public hatred towards him, um, Serenus Jr. escaped Rome and found shelter in Ravenna. Uh, but was forced by the emperor to return and to and compelled to carry on uh, with the trial. Uh, Bibius Serenius Senior, the accused, uh, previously uh, convicted uh, for vis publica and uh, already exiled, uh, was perceived as an enemy by Tiberius. Uh, he was deemed as guilty. Uh, he was deemed as guilty, but since he was uh, already in exile, he was allowed to return to the island where he was detained. Uh, so even if the charges were not true, uh, Dereus was convicted and uh, uh, Vibius Serenius Jr., the accuser, was not punished. Uh, however, as we can see in the paragraph number 30, uh, the suicide of the ex-praetor Cornutus uh, shocked the public opinion. Cornutus was cited as one of uh, Serenus' uh, father, the father's accomplices, but committed suicide to escape uh, a conviction uh, of Maiesta that seemed certain. Some senators tried, we can see, uh, to limit the rewards uh, given to the accusers if the accused uh, had killed himself before the verdict, but the emperor. Uh, acting with a harshness, which was uh, uncommon for him, stepped in to protect uh, the delatores and their prizes, going as far as calling them the guardians of the state. Uh, in, the, in the text number four, we see that Bibius Serenus uh, Jr. later slanderously accused Fonteius Capito, uh, but again escaped conviction. Uh, and we can see here how the accusers tied to the emperors did not incur in any risk. Uh, however, those who were not protected by the princeps um, could be punished. The emperor's accusatores were usually granted uh, financial benefits, but also political advancements, as we can see in the trial against uh, Libo Drusus in uh, 16 AD, which is uh, text number five. Uh, we see in the paragraph number 32 uh, that uh, uh, even if the charges against Libo Drusus were inconsistent, uh, Drusus was convicted and uh, Drusus' estate was divided among its accusers and those uh, who were members of the senatorial class uh, were given the ranks of praetors uh, extra ordinem um, that is without the need of performing the magistrature and the duties connected to it. Um, however, the sources sometimes recall also the sanctioning of um, accusers. They could be subjected to harsh punishments, especially at the beginning of the reign of a new emperor, as we can see with the punishment under Nero of uh, Publius Willius Rufus, which was a consul suspectus in 41 AD, and a notorious delator under the reign of Claudius. In this case, however, the defense argument put up by Suilius is uh, quite interesting, since he didn't try to deny his actions, uh, but he declared that he had acted on behalf and under command of the late emperor Claudius, as we can see in the text number five on the paragraph 43. Uh, we see that his defense didn't go well since Nero declared that no trace of his action was found in Claudius uh, uh, in the registers of the official acts uh, of the reign of Claudius. The commentary uh, were handed down from one emperor to another, and it seems that among its contents were the names of the accusers acting on behalf of the principes, on the, of the princeps and the tasks uh, given to them. Suilius was thus exiled to the, Balear to the Balearic island and half his, his estate was confiscated by the treasury. Um, the Delatores obviously 
um, expected also protection from the emperor. Sometimes, however, uh, the princeps had to consent to the punishment of the accusers to not alienate the upper classes of support or where or where uh, when they went too far, as we can see in the text number seven. Um, we see that here Tiberius still managed to protect uh, Firmius Catus from the wrath of the other senators. Uh, he could not oppose uh, his expulsion from the Senate, uh, but spared him uh, um, the exile. All these factors um, contributed to the growth of the number of pending criminal proceedings, uh, which was also another aspect of this phenomenon. The pe these pending cases clogged the, the courts and slowed down the carrying out of the administration of justice. Um, during the reign of, the reign of uh, Claudius, the burden on the courts was at a breaking point. So that's no wonder that the first attempts uh, to, reduce, to reduce the number of the pending trials by introducing a new procedural crime on uh, the Ordo Judiciorum Publicorum was made under this emperor. Secondary, the aim of Claudius was also to tackle the uh, regnum accusatorum, the tyranny of the accusers, as we can see in the source number eight, which is uh, a papyrus. Um, one of the mistreatments of the time was the fact that accusers could keep the criminal proceeding pending for an unlimited amount of time. The idea was uh, to damage the accused with the blame connected to the status of indicted, uh, usually to extort something from him or simply out of spite. From a legal standpoint, uh, the only statutory bulwark against the mistreatments of delatores and accusatores was the crimen calumnie, established by Alexa Remia in the late second century, early first century before Christ. Under the provisions of this law, whoever brought forth charges was barred from the possibility to exercise ever again the right to accuse anyone else, the loss of use accusandi. Uh, this was, however, easily avoidable by simply dropping the charges before the verdict. Under the reign of Claudius, the situation did not change for the standard jury course proceedings and uh, uh, until, sorry, the reign of Claudius, and he was the first to try to limit the, then, un the until then unrestricted liberty given to the accusers by the means of a structural intervention on the procedural rules of the criminal trials of the Ordo Judicium Publicorum. The uh, BGU 611 Papyrus contains uh, the transcript of Horatio Principis in Senatu Habita, uh, where Claudius aimed to impose a punishment against those accusatores who, after having uh, started a judicium publicum against someone, decided to sub subsequently drop the accusations. You can see, I'm sorry, it's on the different page. Uh, these subjects were equalized to the calumniators and were thus punished, I think, with the loss of the jus accusandi. Um, later on, uh, in 61 AD, the Senatus Consultum Turpilianum uh, reshaped this regulation, but I don't have the time to delve into this uh, since uh, I'm running short uh, on time. Uh, the aim of uh, the Papyrus uh, and uh, the later Senatus Consultum Turpilianum was clearly to introduce, uh, to introduce some form of limitation to the improper activity of the accusers and delators through the menace of punishments. Uh, but uh, it was hardly enough uh, to stem the tide since the emperors still needed their services. Um, these provisions also were easily avoidable, uh, Begeu uh, and the Senatum Consultor Turpilianum, by employing a strawman or uh, the, fix, the, the, the fixed pena legis remie uh, imposed by for calumny and tergiversatio was hardly a deterrent for anyone. And uh, we have seen that also accusers uh, uh, acting on behalf of the emperor um, there was a ha hardly any risk of being convicted. Uh, I will conclude uh, with the end of the Julio Claudian dynasty, the situation began, uh, began to change, starting with Titus and Domitian, 
but uh, especially uh, under Nerva and uh, Trajan, uh, the emperor started to generally oppose the use of criminal trials to keep the opposition in check. Uh, they favored the assimilation of the opponents in the new ruling apparatus in place of the sheer repression of the dissent, and also they strongly opposed the, the fiscal delatores, um, as stated by Pliny in the uh, Panegyricus dedicated to Trajan, which is uh, uh, text number 13. Um, with the new policy set by these emperors, uh, the, this new policy set by those emperors uh, uh, did not eliminate completely the problems of the Roman criminal justice system that we have seen. Uh, they were innate in a system in which was up to the quivis de populo to step up and act on behalf of the collective. Um, however, this new course managed to limit the negative aspects of the activity of the delatores uh, compared to the extremes uh, reached uh, during the previous age. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if I, if I run uh, too long with my speech. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was really rich uh, with a lot of sources, and we compensate, compensate your time with others which were shorter. Uh, so, um, and I see uh, this uh, title, part of this title, Princeps qui delatores non castigat, irritat was taken from Svetonius. This yes. is yes. my uh, yes. Question, but then I found it in your paper later on. And uh, now, um, uh, another participant uh, is uh, uh, going to present her paper, and this is Victoria Saracin uh, from University of Warsaw, Faculty of Law and Administration. And her title is a Guideline on Crime and Punishment systematic approach towards a liberi terribilis. Uh, please. Thank you very much. And my colleague is just uploading the handout for the participants online so that you can see it as well. I think we have to uh, turn off the other microphone. The professor. I think. Anyway, the those of you who are here, you have, I hope so, you have my handouts on your desk so you can um, easily. A brief question to the participants online. Can you see the handout already or not yet? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Amazing. So, we see. Um, thank you. If it, oh, Some of the fragments on the handout may actually look familiar because uh, they were included as well in the handout of Silvegio. And here I wanted to, before I start whatever is the merits of my presentation, uh, so um, Actually, I'm so very glad that the key lecture was attached to um, this particular topic because thanks for that and thanks for the presentation and the lecture of Professor Beggio, I can make some simplifications that are due to the time management uh, uh, and it should be perfectly understandable for you, even though if I make something more simple than it should be, because it just the time doesn't allow me to elaborate on that. It's a very broad material. So, uh, looking at the time, uh, I would like to first present the structure of my uh, presentation so it's more comprehensible, and then I will just um, go uh, with the merits. So, in the first part, I want to. Um, touch the topic that was already mentioned here, so the division between uh, delicta and crimina, and why I uh, am safe to use the term criminal law here in my presentation, and why I am aware that the term criminal law, what it covers here, does not, it, it does not cover 
all the criminal law, what I have here and what I will present here to you. So that's the first um, part. And the second part will be um, the essential part of my uh, speech, let's say. So um, I will present some, but only some of the conclusions, um, my conclusions arising from the analysis of, of the whole book uh, 48 of the digest uh, of Justinian and I shall make a reservation or actually underline the fact that whenever I'm speaking about the digest in the course of my speech I mean specifically the digest of Justinian because um, the part of uh, Corpus Civilis because this is what I uh, here analyze and this is uh, what I focus on uh, during my research and finally I will um, go to some uh, conclusions and um, these are again I'm underlining the fact that these are some conclusions because um, I've been conducting a research that is uh, very very wide uh, within the project led um, by Professor Jakob Stagl or at the University of Warsaw um, Learn Administration <laughs> And we've been working on the systematic analysis on, of the digest. My part is the criminal law part, but here I am only presenting you some uh, of the conclusions and some of the ideas that are to be disputed, uh, of course. And this is only attached to the book 80, uh, 40, I'm sorry, 48 of the digest, which is only one book of the Libilis. So actually the title is covers more than uh, than the speech the speech is an illustration of the problem rather than a bro wide analysis it's it's like a case study let's say but um, based on on a text so um, going uh, to the first uh, point of course I uh, will not here um, put like I, I will not try to settle a dispute that has been here in the doctrine for so many years, uh, the division between the leaked and even the division between the private and, and public. Um, but I wanted to um, just um, explain what I mean uh, behind the term criminal law here. And um, actually, there have been some ideas uh, regarding the division. For instance, um, what we have in the digest that we have Libitus these are two books. One of them is uh, the Privatis Delictis, the other is uh, the Publicis Judictis. So we have the division between the private and uh, the public, but this is not one-to-one, um, -one, uh, since um, there has been, uh, for instance, I, I have, even in my abstract, I have uh, indicated the um, the statement of uh, Maria Luzia Bicali, who says that well, the leaked that fall within the scope of private trial, uh, whereas in uh, fall within the scope of public trial. Of course, this is one of the possible criteria um, divisionis, but this is not the only one. As we um, usually have in law, uh, there is no like um, one good option <laughs> to decide on. Uh, we have to uh, justify our um, mm, we have to justify our approach, and I'm justifying my approach. I'm talking about criminal law, but you see, mm, dividing uh, crimina and delicta on the basis of the trail uh, is um, not uh, always uh, adequate because even if you look at the first text uh, on the handout, I hope it's visible. Yeah, uh, in the very first sentence, you see that. Uh, not uh, I should have indicated this first. Uh, the translations are my own, so I didn't indicate the source. Um, not all the trials concerning crimes are public, but this only which arise from legacies that are public. And uh, the public legacies are listed here. And then on the other page of the handout, you had the index to the volume of the book uh, 48 of the digest, which is like basically a list of these legacies. Uh, which concern public crimes. So here we see that even in the course of the book uh, regarding the public crimes, uh, the very first sentence tells us that, well, these are not all the crimes. Uh, these are uh, the public crimes because they are um, based on the public legacy. But still, the division is not, is, is not let's say, clear-cut. 
and this is the first part um, that I wanted to I want to stress the issue uh, that is still an ongoing discussion. So I want I want to settle um, that uh, that dispute here, and going uh, well now going to the most um, essential let's say part uh, of my of my speech. Um, if we have a closer look, let, let's have a closer look at these uh, two provisions, two first provisions of uh, of the book uh, 48. If we look at it, um, we will notice that the provisions uh, contained here are quite of a general nature. It is that um, they don't, they are not applicable to concrete particular crime or even a factual state. They just cover um, the whole materia of, of the public criminal law, at least that's, that's an intention. And um, since we already know that crimes may be public or maybe not, so this is a public criminal law, uh, as, the, uh, as our chair here uh, said in the introductory speak. So we have, a, we're dealing here with the public criminal law. And the first um, conclusion is that the structure of this uh, first uh, title, um, it, it has like a definition of the subject matter, the first sentence, then the enumeration, and then uh, then like kind of a conclusion. Then uh, we can see that there's a wide range of uh, application of, of this second fragment, um, this um, the second fragment of, of the first title of this book, so the second text on the handout, because it provides a definition of uh, capital crime. And um, like going, because I'm, I know I'm short on time, so I will just explain why I um, put here as the third text only a short fragment of of, of the um, of the title concerning uh, Lex Julia de Vipublica. I put it here because you can see, and this what so Beja also mentioned this kind of a crime, this kind of a punishment. Um, uh, a person condemned with uh, this publica is interdicted from fire and water. And thanks to that, we have a definition of a uh, um, capital crime in the second fragment of the first title. We don't need a further indication that such crime was a capital crime because basing on the type of the sanction, we can decide whether it was a capital crime or it wasn't a capital crime. And this is one of the examples. Um, of one of the examples showing that actually we can somehow apply the provisions from the first title of this book to the other titles and to the other fragments of the other titles in the course of, of this book. So um, my point was that this uh, one example, there are many more, but I was short on time. Uh, so this one selected example illustrates that there's a stacking construction between the provisions of the first title and the subsequent titles regulating the questions of particular crimes. Um, and so this, and this is my biggest point here, this precisely what we would accomplish by um, familiarizing ourselves with the provisions of a general part of the criminal law if we were dealing with modern codifications, which we are not. <laughs> and Going to the conclusions, um, I want to say that talking, uh, using even the term of the general part here, uh, ap applicably to these provisions, I mean absolutely not that there is a general part. I only mean that there's a structure kind of analogous that could mutatis mutandis, and given the conceptual background, of course, serve the same purpose that the modern concept of the general part would do. And under no circumstances I meant to like reconstruct a general part from these provisions uh, via exegesis of the subsequent fragments and no, because I see it pointless and I see it realistically anachronical. Uh, it, it would be because it would be contrary to what the jurists did and what, what the compilers meant. So um, even uh, even though the scope of analogy between um, the introductory titles and uh, general part note to modern jurisprudence is still only a scope of analogy, um, I do believe that while looking at law, uh, even Justinianic law, even Roman law, in a more systematic way, 
we can accomplish more than we could um, basically merely on the individual uh, exegesis of the subsequent fragments. And concluding, this is my last sentence, as uh, Fritz Schulz uh, wrote, the historian, legal historian in this case, is permitted to investigate the ideas working behind the scenes, even if actors themselves were not conscious of them. And with this, I will finish. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria. I will misuse my <laughs> position of uh, uh, president. Just one comment, because um, I agree there is no uh, general uh, part in uh, modern sense of the world in this book 48, but it is in the uh, book 47, I think. If you I read the first part, it is real general part. Uh, but uh, of course we will go. Thesis, okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> <That's the break. laughs> thank you very much. And now um, I would uh, announce uh, our last uh, uh, participant, our colleague from our faculty, University of Belgrade Faculty of Law. Isidara Fierst. She is not going to talk about Roman law, but uh, of course, uh, it's a law of antiquity, a very well known um, idea or, and um, practice of ostracism, ostracism, sorry, uh, in uh, ancient uh, Greek law. Uh, and um, so, um, please, you can start your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to give just a short review of ostracism. As um, an institution in the Athenian democracy, I'm going to talk about its introduction to the Athenian legal order, its nature, regulation and procedure, and finally its replacement with Grafe Paranormon. So, uh, first, let's say what ostracism was. It was a political instrument used in ancient Athens, a democratic instrument, which represents a specific form of banishment of a prominent scholar from the, the city-state of Athens for a period of 10 years without any further punishments or charges. Ostracism was used during the 5th century BC, and during its entire existence it was used a very few times. But the purpose of ostracism was fighting tyranny in favor of strengthening democracy. Both literary and archaeological sources testify to the existence and origin of ostracism. According to Aristotle's constitution of the Athenians, and this is something the scholars approve of, the law on ostracism was passed by Cleisthenes. When we talk about the nature of ostracism, the views of legal and uh, historical scholars differ in its understanding. It can be said, however, with certainty that ostracism was not a punishment in the sense of criminal law, but it was a specific form of punishment uh, towards a somehow guilty um, individual. It was a political democratic punishment. And if we uh, take this as a fact, the question is what the precise motive for ostracism was. So Aristotle in the Constitution of the Athenians states that ostracism was based on the suspicion that the prominent ones were to become tyrants. Pluter, on the other hand, believes that the use of ostracism came from envy towards the most prominent among the citizens. So it is a different view. And according to Thucydides, ostracism was instituted out of fear and insecurity of the citizens of the police, so it is um, quite alike to what Aristotle states. But when analyzed more broadly, ostracism um, must be seen in the context of ancient Greek understanding of honor, which um, mostly relies on their understanding of religion. It is also important to state uh, uh, that Ostracism is much different from exile or banishment in the sense of criminal law. And besides the motives for the procedure of ostracism and besides the procedure itself, what makes it different from exile is the fact that the integral part of ostracism is the return of the exiled person back to Athens after the expiration of 
period of time. So an ostracized, ostracized citizen was not deprived of his civil rights, he was not deprived of his property, and he could come back to Athens after the expiration of 10 years of, or after he was summoned to return. And in that manner, Xantip and Aristides were ostracized only to be invited back to Athens when they were needed. The word ostrakon, ostrakon is derived from the Greek word ostreion, which, mean, which means oyster. Uh, the names of those who were potentially to be uh, exiled were written on shreds of broken potters called ostraka, and hence the name ostracism for the procedure. And the procedure itself was quite simple, and it was in the form of direct democracy. The Ecclesia, which consisted of all free citizens with the ability to vote, held voting for ostracism once in a year. And um, the voting was uh, in the form of a two-round election. The first one uh, being the one for making the decision on the need for ostracism, and the second one, ostracism itself, um, meaning um, voting held as a negative referendum. As a rule, the first round was held in winter, uh, due, um, from December to February, and uh, the second, second round of voting had to take place within the next two months. At the Ecclesia, the simple uh, question was asked, is there any person among you whom you consider to be fundamentally dangerous to the state? If there is one, who is it? The members of the Ecclesia, of the Assembly, could vote for any citizen. They could vote for the prominent politician or they could vote for the neighbor they didn't like. And after the citizens had left their votes on, on Ostracons, the Archons um, would count if the quorum had been achieved and after that they would count the names. Uh, it is not known um, the, uh, the exact uh, number of times uh, the ostracism was used in practice is not known, and, the exact, and so are the dates. But it is assumed with certainty, uh, actually it is certain that it, that it was used at least 10 times. Um, ostracism was um, an instrument mechanism which um, arose as a result of the flourishing uh, new and young democracy of Athens. And it was never formally abolished, but it ceased to exist in the 4th century. And uh, it is considered uh, that it was replaced with grafe paranomon, a public lawsuit, a type of public lawsuit, uh, meaning suit against contrary to the laws. Grafe paranomon was um, introduced by Pericles in the Golden Age of Athens. And in contrast um, to ostracism, uh, Grafe Peranomon brought the focus of people on the decisions on the state and not on the individuals. And the second difference is that it, there was no limit um, on the times, on, uh, on the number of times this, this suit could be used in one year. In a conclusion, we can say that um, quite a short period of history of ancient Greece was marked by ostracism. And uh, this instrument uh, is quite questionable and uh, possibly unjust. And looking at the previous history of ancient Greece, it is um, clear that not one of the elements of ostracism was previously unknown, meaning token voting, aggressive speech, expulsion of citizens. So this is something that existed in ancient Greece and in other, other cultures before the 5th century BC. But uh, ostracism was the first time um, in ancient Greece uh, that it, this was so completely, completely formed. Uh, the institution of ostracism formally represents um, a mechanism of direct democracy established in the interest of state and the citizens, but it is in fact in its core an instrument of political struggle that serves to el eliminate prominent or different ones. So this is an instrument in, in a political fight between the members of the elite. Maybe that uh, it is not why it was established, but it is how it was used. But um, even after so many centuries, ostracism continues to attract attention, especially today, modern sociologists and experts in social relations study the modern phenomenon of so-called cancel culture which is considered to be modern ostracism. 
Um, and at the end, I would um, like to say that um, ostracism was indeed an instrument of direct democracy, uh, but it um, it could have been very susceptible, uh, susceptible for misuse. However, since it was used in, in such a short period of time, and since it was used uh, only a few times, it never reached the needed capacity for such actions. It never brought danger to the democracy of Athens and the democracy of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for the attention. Uh, thank you very much uh, to our students for very interesting uh, papers uh, and um, we have uh, plenty of time for the discussion. This time I will not misuse my position uh, of president, although I have <laughs> questions uh, for almost everybody. As, and uh, I will uh, give uh, you now a uh, possibility to ask questions and uh, to start this, this discussion. Go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, Professor Tamaza Beja, uh, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all the students for the nice presentations. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I only have a few remarks on three different presentations. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, with regard to the first presentation, uh, it's, a, it's only a suggestion. <laughs> uh, since uh, uh, you mentioned the trial to Jesus, uh, I would suggest you to have a look at the uh, point of view of Massimo Miglietta, as written down in his book, Inri, uh, concerning the, process, the trial to Jesus. Because uh, in this case, Miglietta uh, analyzes not only the uh, religious aspect of uh, Jesus' uh, crime, but also the political aspects of Jesus' crime. And this could be an interesting reading if you are interested in this kind of topic. Um, then I have a, a, a couple of remarks uh, um, on the second presentation. Uh, sorry, I don't precisely remember the names. So sorry, I just say the first, the second, and the third presentation. I, I hope it's clear. So on the second presentation, uh, there, there is a point uh, that I will I, I will suggest to uh, pay attention to a point because you say. Uh, you put together crimes and delicts, and uh, well, we are in the last century, uh, so in the first century before Christ, so crimes and delicts are quite clearly distinguished at that time. But this is not the main problem, so the main problem concerns legal procedure. The case that you mentioned, the case of the Danke, for example, you say that uh, the man, the, the owner of the Danke, wanted uh, some stuff back, and wanted to be paid for the damages that he suffered. So this means that uh, there is a concurrency of two, this kind, two, two different kinds of actions. An actio that is a vindicatio rei, in the case of having back, so to have back stuff. And uh, an actio that is an actio penalis, in the case of the uh, reimbursement of the damages. So there is the problem of concurrency of actions first. And secondly, we are in the formulary procedure. So we are dealing with the formulary procedure, not with the questiones perpetue, that are the criminal legal procedure. So you have to distinguish maybe the different cases. And this could be uh, important also because you know that in the formulary procedure, uh, you have the inus vocatio, that is anyway different than the nominis de Lazio that is typical of the questiones perpetue. So maybe you have to try to distinguish the different cases in this uh, um, under this perspective. And uh, then I have a, a, a couple of comments on the fourth presentation, um, in particular the first text that was mentioned uh, during the presentation. It is the very no, well-known uh, text by Macher, if I remember well. So may I have a look at the, uh, it's the text by Macher on the Judicia Publica. Um, well, there is a problem with this text in the sense that Macher is not defining the Judicia Publica uh, with regard to the other, kind, other kinds of 
procedures used, for example, in the case of Dilix or something like that. Macher is dealing with the problem of how to distinguish Judicia Publica and the kind of punishment that could be applied in the Judicia Publica and to distinguish this kind of Judicia from the cognizione extraordinum. This is the point of the text. So Macher, as all the uh, Roman jurists of the Severan age, wanted to try to put to, to make somehow clear the distinction between the procedure of the cogniziones and the procedure of the judicia publica. And so he defines the judicia publica in this way by saying that you, the judicia were publica if the tribunals were, and so the crimes were, uh, the, 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 the cases um, punished as crimes were established by issuing a lex publica and if it was possible for anyone to sue the and to so uh, act uh, before the magistrate. This is the point that distinguish, these are the points that distinguish judicia publica from cognizione extraordinum. But this does not mean that crimes created by leges publica could not be discussed in the cognizione extraordinum. This is the big problem that the Roman jurists at the time of the, at the Severan dynasty tried to clarify because it was not clear, well clear before, because there was this kind of overlapping between the two legal procedures. So this is the very point of the text by Macher. And it's uh, it's very important for us to understand the development of legal procedure from the second century, in particular, from the second century AD onwards. So uh, th this is only a suggestion, of course, uh, I would, if I was you, I would focus on the problem of the legal procedure when dealing, when analyzing the first text. This is the, the main point. And uh, there are um, some uh, great, wonderful uh, works by Fabio Botta on this topic. So Fabio Botta knows a lot better than me <laughs> all this uh, subject, subject, but still, I would say, my suggestion is try to focus on the problem of the legal procedure. That's the point of, of the, um, the text by Macher. And the second text, uh, the second text is by Paulus, uh, has somehow to do with the same problem, but for a, from a different perspective. So the second text by Paulus says it's a capital um, trial, it's a judicium publicum, only the kind of trial uh, that was um uh, that um, was created to punish a kind of crime that would be punished by applying a capital punishment so the effect of the penalty affects uh, the effect of the penalties uh, affect uh, the kind of trial that's the point so macher and paulus uh somehow um, are describing different situations. So are considering the syntagma judicia publica from different perspectives. Macher is focused on the legal procedure. Paulus is focused on the effects deriving from the penalties that will be applied to the convicts. That's, uh, this, these are my suggestions, I would say, only to, to uh, on how to um, uh, interpret the two passages that you mentioned that are essential, of course, to the study of the um, 48th book uh, of the Digest. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the questions. I think so now um, uh, students can answer in the order of these uh, questions and suggestions. I, and, uh, I think uh, whether uh, Ivan, is, uh, Ivan is going uh, Well, uh, thank you for your suggestion. I surely will uh, read the piece that you have suggested to me uh, because I really um, adore that period of the Roman Empire. So, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. No, okay. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, bringing this point uh, because maybe I was a little bit in haste, so I didn't uh, uh, I weren't clear, clear enough. 
I think in Egypt we can't even say about existence of formulary procedure. So this will be no formula given. It's proceeding, we can say, some cognition proceeding. If we want, as a lot of scholars say, this extraordinary procedure, or simply, I, I would stress. But the first firms of uh, formal of cogniciones extraordinary in, in Egypt were modeled on the formal procedure. It's it's quite it's well known. Uh, yes, but still, it is not formal procedure, and uh, if you, we need to have some basis to use in the in the process in the trial, but still there won't be any formula given, and I hear. I'm not sure if we can even say we have two non-Roman citizens. We have uh, two um, Greek Egyptians. So we have two Egyptians, this uh, Peregrini Nullius Civitatis, uh, and they are dealing the issue in the legal regime that is under Roman influence, but still they, I don't think they use any Roman institution. I only showed this as an example how universal they were formed, but this is more a case that is still um, in this maybe or might or it's better to say Egyptian tradition and not really a proper Roman trial as these later judges will be very free to use also Roman norms, but not only. They can use Egyptian uh, custom law, or there's a lot of debate how it is in fact used, but there's, I don't see here any action being brought for sure. The, the substantive law could be a custom, customary law, of course, but the procedure was usually applied according to the idea of the development of judicial legitima from the first century before Christ onwards. So I, I don't see the problem according to the, the the application of the procedure. That is not, of course, the formal procedure in strict terms, of course, but still, um, I don't see this point. And in any case, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the a kind of uh, reivindicatio cannot, if we want to call that, uh, that kind of action like that, cannot be uh, dealt with as a kind another kind of fact like for example the assault so my opinion but it's only it's only my opinion my point of view Uh, so I, on the other hand, I, I will not be disagreeing with you because I uh, there's nothing to disagree on. It just I think uh, that I I was touching a little bit different problem because of course these are these two texts are different perspectives, but they are both still applicable to the further text. Since I was dealing with it, maybe I should have. Um, pointed this out like in the very beginning that I was um, referring to the legal system set by the digest like in general as a whole and not really um, making an um, exegesis of this particular text in the legal background that they were issued in. So of course if I were to analyze this text as individual text in the context of the whole work of, of a jurist, for example, Matter or, for example, Paulus, like in the second text, I would um, put in um, underline different issues. And since I was trying to show the structure, I did not really um, touch the very um, substance of, of this text and what they were dealing with. I hope I explain myself kind of at least what my approach was. But of course, I agree with you because uh, if I were to analyze them, I, I would I would focus definitely on the issues that you that you mentioned. And, but may, may I ask you then, um, don't you think that you're running the risk to the, you're running the risk to put a structure, a dogmatic structure on the text, even if the dogmatic structure 
doesn't emerge from the text. Don't you? I just it's just yeah. a question. Yeah, I think I think I'm doing that, but I think the compilers did the very same thing. I, I don't think so, but okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's that's the point. Okay, thank you. I have one question for the colleague, if that's all right. Uh, for Ivan Adam Basic, um, you've written that um, the punishments for the close people of the emperor could be mitigated as much as possible. So, in which way uh, were the empresses punished? Could you tell us something about that? Are there any sources that testify to? Okay. Uh, well, surely, uh, I think that you've been um, interrogated by my story about um, uh, Messalina Valeria. Uh, well, she wasn't the first example. The first example was uh, Livia Drusilla. Uh, she was the wife of the first emperor, Octavian Augustus, uh, who had been uh, banished to an island after his death, uh, not to be an opponent to the uh, next emperor. But uh, the most interesting thing is uh, when we had a lecture on the status law in the Roman law, I've asked our professor uh, Andrea Katancic uh, what was the position of the uh, empresses? Um, did they, uh, were they seen as the uh, other women in Rome or did they have some special treats? Uh, he said, well, they have been uh, treated the same as the other women in the Roman law. Uh, only if they stay alive. <laughs> uh, so um, maybe uh, the first, the most common thing they've done to the empresses has been that they've been killed. Uh, exactly, Messalina Valeria was uh, the first uh, to enter that show. Um, she had been killed in the gardens of uh, Lucullus, uh, when, where she escaped with her mother, I think, uh, when uh, she tried to uh, be an opponent to the next emperor in the line. So after the Barius died, because she was uh, his wife, uh, she uh, wanted to stay on the power, but didn't succeed and had been killed. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture. My name is Georgi Goikovic. I'm from Belgrade the Faculty of Law. Um, I have a, one comment and one uh, question for my colleague Isidora, whose work I liked very much. So um, it, it should be noted that despite the possibility of return, uh, harshness of this punishment, ostracism, has to be explained having in mind uh, the political philosophy of Greeks, or more precisely the Athenians, uh, where the life was only meaningful if it was uh, for and in the polis. So there was no such thing as private life as we know it today. And the only worthy life worthy of a man was the one in polis. We know the theory of uh, Zom Politikon. So it, it, despite the fact that it was not a criminal punishment, uh, it still was harsh in, in this sense, I'm saying. And the question for you is, uh, what do you think, uh, based, based upon your research, did it actually help stabilize the democracy? Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, I absolutely agree. The polis and its harmony was the greatest good for the Athenians. Well, ostracism was used very few times, only 10, ten times. We can't say that it, that had any influence to the, the functioning of the of Athens, and this was the time in which uh, the regulation was not so formal. There were no many um, legal acts or laws that would regulate different um, uh, different things in in the life of the Athenians. So um, we can only assume that it could have been dangerous if it had been used much more. But um, uh, the expulsion of nine uh, civilians, nine citizens from the uh, uh, city-state of Athens was surely not something that would absolutely um, diminish its functioning. 
So th that is my opinion. I, I might be wrong, but um, it is what I, I've read in, in sources and in, in um, many articles. Ostracism was an unsuccessful experiment, experiment of direct democracy. It is not something that we uh, could admire now. We can analyze it and, and uh, learn from the Athenians and their democracy, but it is not so important as it is sometimes stated in literature. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I would like um, to ask one question. In fact, I was inspired by this discussion by Professor uh, Beja with uh, um, colleague uh, Katzper and also by the, his title of the um, uh, paper, They Stole My Pig. And uh, I think uh, I would like, in fact, to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, my, my main uh, uh, point is about um, this, uh, again, uh, this systematization or, or uh, not, not only um, um, division between uh, public criminal law and uh, private law in, on um, um, example of furtum, uh, because um, um, uh, Professor uh, Beja, you said at the beginning that Furtum um, in the uh, early times was sanctioned uh, by death penalty. Um, and uh, later on, of course, it became uh, civil wrong, so source of obligation. But also we can see that, that uh, a very blurred line between these two, uh, this, uh, between uh, in, in the uh, case of Furtum. For example, if you, re if you read this uh, book 47, then we will, uh, which is in fact uh, one of the Libri Terribiles. Um, uh, first part is about private dialects, dialects so where also Furtum is included. But later on, you also have a, a certain titles about special types of fur furtum. For example, furtum uh, of the cattle. Uh, so this is a case, they, a case they stole my pig, for example, or, or furtum in the bath. And so such special kinds of furtum, which are criminal um, uh, uh, delicts or, cri or in fact crimes and even punished by death, uh, for example, and it depends whether you steal one pig or two or, <laughs> I think five, when you steal five pigs, then uh, this is a crime, and then you can be punished by death. And if you steal one pig, then, of course, whether it is for to manifest them or, neck manifest and then you pay a uh, money pen, uh, um, um, this penalty in money, twofold or threefold uh, or fourfold. So, um, for example, I don't know whether, and I think probably I'm not really expert, and uh, if I'm, uh, I couldn't say I'm a beginner in uh, criminal uh, law. I've heard a lot of new things, for example, these different kinds of procedures, Judicia Publica and our extraordinary procedure, I think at the beginning was also some other kind of procedure. But I think that uh, I can partly understand what a uh, uh, colleague um, Katzper said, uh, that in, uh, in uh, these provinces, uh, this was not so strictly applied, these procedures. Like, for example, as you said, this example of vindicatio and this, this would be damnum, uh, lex aquilia and whether it is mixed action, can it be uh, um, uh, consumed by one or it can be um, um, both uh, cumulatively applied. So I think it is too, um, too complicated. Uh, for um, for those provinces, I'm not sure, but uh, well, this is my 
um, comment, and I don't know whether it is also a kind of question or so whatever. Thank you. I don't know who should start first, maybe sort of Bedger, if you. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, so thank you. No, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, um, uh, I agree with you. Uh, some of your comments and uh, for example in the second century AD the Abigeatus so the Furtum of the cattle uh, developed and it was uh, punished uh, by applying the damnatio ad metalla so the force of labor in the mines that's that's one of the cases for example discussed by the jurist yet the Abigeatus developed at the time of the principate not before more or less but still I, I completely understand the point and I agree with the fact that Furtum was punished in different ways over the time. Uh, my point was a point concerning legal procedures. And even if we can, of course, affirm that the formal procedure was not applied to Egypt, we cannot still think and believe like 150 years ago that Egypt was something completely different from the rest of the provinces. So Ludwig Mittais already died, and I suppose that is not the case to uh, try to revive Ludwig, the, the Ludwig Mittais. I mean, uh, that's a point concerning, my point was simply a point concerning procedure. And if we don't have a look at the, uh, I mean, if we don't have a look at the sources and what the sources say, we simply try to apply our pre-conceptual, uh, pre-conceptualized theories to the, uh, the sources that we read. That's my point. This was my suggestion concerning the fact that it is always, uh, I would say, uh, cautious to try to distinguish the singular cases according to the typical uh, uh, facts that are punished. That was my, 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 simply my case. So I didn't want to say anything more about the question of Furtum or, or, or something like that. And of course, there were different customs in different provinces. We know that. Uh, and uh, well, that, that, that was all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So, with this, uh, all things uh, having been said, uh, I think I can now agree with you, uh, but uh, I think I need to stress one thing because while we look at the papyri as a source of legal knowledge, most of the papyri, in, uh, in, and in the case of these petitions, we have this bottom up perspective. So, we are looking for the documents made by person who have been wronged. And I wanted to stress that here we can't really see any kind of this doctrinal sophistication. And they are simply telling what has happened and not doing any Legal. Uh, sorry, do, do you think that the Roman that the Romans didn't simply explain what happened? So the Romans didn't go to before the magistrate to say, "Oh, I just uh, uh, suffered under the crime of ambitus punished by the lex tullia de ambitu or something like that." They simply said this was the fact. So we have to to have a look at the sources, either papyri or epigraphic sources or other kind of sources. So I don't, I don't, I didn't take up this point at all. Yeah, so uh, that's why I said that this division among delict and crimina wasn't important for the petitioners. Not that it wasn't important like at all, this division. That from this perspective of petitioners, I, or we can simply say broader, this Romans in Egypt, not really Romans, but uh, the inhabitants of the empire, it wasn't this important. So I think we, can, unless it goes further in already adjudication, but it is then a case of lawyers and of judges, judges not being lawyers, but a later, of, of course, later, uh, in later times, being more and more educated. Uh, so that was my point, and I think about, uh, I don't know, uh, so to say, about sources, about punishment, in Egypt, uh, the sources are not so generous, uh, so to say, uh, about how it ended. Mm, and yeah, thank you very much.
Uh, any other questions? Maybe also one um, for uh, uh, Matteo Castinelli, uh, because um, maybe uh, only um, to uh, maybe I did not uh, totally understand what is uh, um, the difference uh, between accusatores and the de uh, delatores. Uh, is it? Um, um, uh, sorry, it is very fundamental. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, it was not. Uh, the, the, is the, there is a, um, sometimes there is um, uh, also one. Uh, is it maybe um, um, synonym or? or is it not? <clears throat> Yeah, it, it depends. I, I said like a, a little phrase about it. It's a, a matter of terminological. Uh, it's a terminological thing. In the sources, sometimes we find uh, uh, the, the term delatores uh, in a broader sense to indicate uh, uh, both uh, criminal accusers and the fiscal um, delator who uh, puts up uh, an action in front of uh, um, a, a, a fiscal. Uh, a fiscal trial, uh, but uh, we see that uh, um, in a strict sense, uh, it means uh, it was used originally to indicate the accusers, since uh, the nominis de Lazio, which uh, which uh, which uh, was the act that uh, started all the criminal proceedings in the Questiones Perpetue. Uh, but also we see in the sources that sometimes we find the term to be uh, synonymous to to both indicate criminal accusers and fiscal uh, and fiscal delatores so it's you have to look at the sources to try to understand if the term is used in this kind of ambivalent sense to indicate both or um, to indicate only uh, the fiscal delatores or maybe if it's speaking about uh, the um, uh, the fiscal Delatores, like in uh, in the in the text from uh, uh, Svetonius, where I take uh, the the title of my of my speech, uh, "Princeps uh, qui delatores non uh, non castigat irritat." Uh, the uh, Svetonius uh, was talking about uh, uh, fiscales calumnias. So here we are we are talking about uh, certainly about uh, um, fiscal delatores. This kind of ambivalence uh, comes from uh, also from the uh, similarities between uh, the the tasks, uh, the task, uh, um, the officium, um, which was uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, from the similarities that came from the the, the function of the the delatores and accusatores. Both of them uh, they were to act. Uh, uh, they were like previous the populo, so were like private private citizens who um, decided voluntarily to uh, start a trial to uphold to um, to uphold a law or uh, to in general sense to um, to they they were like uh, I don't know invested uh, of the public good they were like acting for the public good so in both of them that we have these kind of similarities they were like private citizens acting uh, acting oh, for yeah. the acting Here, for, uh, no. acting for uh, the public and uh, also he had prizes i think sorry oh my god i'm sorry dude. for the inter Theodore, your Dude, mic on is screen. on and you're not I'm the one on the speaking. Yes, you're on the screen because you're speaking. Please turn on your, off your mic and let Matteo continue. Thank you. So I was saying uh, it was uh, um, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, of uh, um, uh, ambiguity from a term terminological point of view. Uh, it's mainly due to the similarities and also because when. Uh, the, the, the fiscal proceeding where the, the like the delator in a strict sense uh, is used uh, it's like uh, it was like introduced by August Augustus uh, marital legislation and uh, it was modeled on the um, on the trials of the questions perpetua more or less 
Thank you very much for your explanation. And uh, is uh, uh, any other questions? Um, uh, we are um, almost in minute on time for another break. But uh, if uh, there is any other question, please. So if not, then uh, uh, I think uh, we can uh, close this uh, um, uh, this session and uh, we can have a coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you.